Um, um, Susan, just give me a thumbs up when we should start. We, we are live, uh, they see us now. Um, and uh, uh, so you have to be well behaved. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but no, it's too early to start. It's too, it's yeah, too early, right? Yeah, we have five more minutes, so. Yeah, yeah, so time. maybe use the time to change the world. <laughs> Come up with a I proposal. I see a lot of participants joining early. Yes, people I mean, seem the very people excited. People who are on are on early. It's still time. <laughs> Hello, all the early birds. Welcome for the Wits event. Susan, one more question. So, um, how do I see the uh, live stream chat? Like, in case someone is posting questions, I, how would that uh, come up I, in the chat? Uh, uh, I can tell them to disable live stream chat and just to do, uh -huh. you know, I, that's not usually my preference. I hate the YouTube <laughs> chats, but, uh -huh. and, and then you would just get questions from this, from this chat is what I'm sure. thinking. That sounds would good. You, shall I, I, you know, I mean, we have someone monitoring it if you, you know, but I, I was thinking of asking him to disable YouTube chat, but it's up to you. Yeah, it'll be better if we have like one stream of chat, but all I wanted to make sure is that we have the stream of chat, like people are able to, you know, like put in their questions on the chat. Well, they can put their questions here in the chat here. I mean, if some of you want to try putting questions in, yep. saying hi in the chat, please go ahead. So we make sure everybody knows how to do that. Um. Can people see my chat? So by the, yeah, okay, um, perfect. Okay, he's not going to disable uh, YouTube chat, but he may he'll watch it. He's we've got yeah. somebody watching. So, so for good. the for the panel, I think it's important that we uh, somehow manage to solicit uh, questions from the audience. But if we do have two hundred people and hope for one to speak up, that's that's kind of maybe difficult. So if people want to put them. Yeah questions into the chat and then maybe you, Ashwari, you pick them from there and post them to us. Yep, absolutely. Or, yeah, that, that. Might, that might be the best way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people are, are saying things already in the chat. So let's see if anybody else is going to say something in the chat. Yeah, I saw like two other people post on the chat. So yep, I think yep. we're good there. Let me look and see how many people are on YouTube. Is anyone on YouTube yet? So it would be a good idea, like before everyone's presentation, they can just like, you know, give a quick uh, uh, introduction about themselves and then go ahead with the presentation. Sure. Wow, there are more on YouTube than there are in, on here. There are 20 yeah, wow. on YouTube already. <laughs> nice. 27 now. It's going up like your event rate. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely post that on my Twitter. Yeah. Um, do you want me to put the um, link? Yeah, probably you can put the link on the chat. Okay, Happy. let me do that. Let me do that. Let me get the link, the YouTube link. Um, okay, so the, the chat is on on YouTube. That's all right. Great. Um, we have lots of people on. YouTube. I'm going to put the YouTube. If you if you all want to tweet now, this link you can mm -hmm. get more people on. Uh, yep. On YouTube. Let me give it to you in the chat. 
the YouTube link where you're live streaming. Perfect. Okay, I think we should be good to go. Go ahead. Hey, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Women Data Science event. So we are uh, here joining in from New York. Um, the uh, event is featured from New York, but most of us due to the pandemic are joining from, from various different locations. We also have like Ratif joining in from India. Uh, thank you so much everyone like for accommodating your uh, time preferences and like uh, your schedules to attend this event. Uh, I'm really, really excited to host this event. So we are doing this in collaboration with IBM. Um, and um, so just going over the quick agenda for today, let me share my screen. So uh, today's event would be around like three and a half hours. Uh, we would start with an opening note and we would be uh, introducing the speakers. Then uh, we would be having the speaker sessions. So we would be having Rati, then uh, Yuyu, then Claudia and myself. Uh, then we would be having a 15 minute break just so you guys have like, you know, um, a tea break or a coffee break. Then we would be following uh, the speaker sessions with Marlene and Julia. Uh, in the end, we would be having like a half an hour uh, data science career panel because we realized that there are a lot of uh, budding data scientists who are super excited about getting into the field and they have a lot of questions how to uh, pursue their career, how to be a researcher or uh, in, uh, in corporate world. So we would be here to answer all your questions. Uh, all of us are from very, very diverse backgrounds coming from different industries, all of us working in data science. So that pretty much sums up about how wide data science is and how uh, um, it is spread over, like how useful it is in all the different industries. So we would be walking you over uh, the best uh, career path, questions um, around data science. And in the end, we would be wrapping up with some closing notes. So. Um, uh, yep, uh, any, all of the people who have joined the event, uh, you are free, feel free to uh, enter your questions on the chat. Uh, we would really appreciate if you guys can keep yourself on mute while the speakers are speaking. And uh, if you have any questions during the speaker sessions, you can please uh, add it to the chat and we would be, uh, we would be able to respond it to you uh, by the end of the session. So uh, we would really appreciate like not to interrupt the speakers in between. Uh, yeah, that is pretty much it. And um, I would probably go ahead and introduce uh, the speakers. So we have Rati. She is uh, joining us from Morgan Stanley. She is the head of analysis uh, team. And uh, we have Yuyu. Uh, she's joining us from um, she's joining us uh, from uh, BNY Mellon. Uh, she is the director of uh, data science at the institute. Uh, then we have Claudia. She's joining us from Two Sigma. And she's the chief scientist there. Um, then, hi, uh, I'm Ishwarya. Uh, I am a data scientist in IBM Data Science Elite team. Uh, we have Marlene. Uh, she's joining us from Instagram. Uh, she's a data scientist in Instagram. Uh, we have Julia. She is a uh, data privacy counsel at Pandora. So. Um, each of the speakers would be introducing themselves in detail uh, while they are presenting. And uh, you can feel free to connect with them on, on LinkedIn or uh, Twitter as, as in how they wish. Uh, and you can like uh, follow them on these platforms. So uh, yeah, that is uh, pretty much all I had for the introduction and the agenda. Uh, I guess um, we can start the event. Um, Rati, do you wanna go ahead and uh, start your session? Sure. Hi, Ashwarya. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Ashwarya, and, and hi, everyone. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. Hopefully, you'll be able to see. 
let me know if you can't. Um, I'm Rati Sharma, as uh, Ashwarya already introduced. I'm an executive director and head of data analytics platforms at Morgan Stanley. I've been um, working for now about 14 years and started out my journey uh, with a bachelor's and a master's in computer science. Um, and more recently, um, I've act I had a team of data um, uh, analysts at, uh, at Morgan Stanley. And today I'm actually going to talk about big data and its pitfalls. I'd like to kick off with um, anchoring us with some numbers. 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are produced by humans every day. 1.7 megabytes of data are created every second by every person in 2020. 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years. The amount of data that we generate is staggering. And big data has been instrumental in the progress in, you know, in modern tech. However, in this talk, I want to do away with some of the unrealistic expectations about big data and demonstrate uh, its limitations and also critically evaluate um, the pros and cons. Data is as ubiquitous as the air we breathe. Big data has become a theoretical construct that surrounds everything, everywhere, and all time. And it's less about data that is big than the capacity to search, aggregate, and cross-reference large data sets. So much so that you know, we know that big data is, is, is instrumental and has been responsible for the advancements in machine learning and AI, and is often thought as, of as the lubricant behind modern technological advancements. And thus, it has been put on a pedestal and touted as a solution to all problems of society and capable of making the world a safer and better place. And yet, if it's too good to be true, then probably it's not. And we'll look at some of the fallacies and pitfalls in the next few slides. The economics of attention, data, data everywhere, where do I look? Herbert Simon, who was the dual winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics and the Turing Award, was a true visionary. And in his research in the 1970s was able to foresee, and I quote, what information consumes is rather obvious. It consumes the attention of its recipients. Hence, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention and a need to allocate that attention efficiently among the overabundance of information sources that might consume it. That's the game we are in. Earlier, we were starved for data, and now we are drowning in it. Big data changed the definition of knowledge. This is an interesting philosophical conundrum where big data have led to a paradigm shift, creating an environment where we gather data first and produce hypotheses later. And this makes extracting knowledge from information that much more difficult. As we seek to gain insights born from the data, and I quote, who knows why people do what they do? The point is they do it and we can track and measure it with unprecedented fidelity. With enough data, the numbers speak for themselves. And there is a tendency to think of big data as inherently truthful and meaningful. And meaning trans seems to transcend context as well as domain specific knowledge with the idea that anyone um, that has the ability to decode statistics or data visualization can derive knowledge out of it. The belief that we can start with pure observations alone without anything in the nature of a theory itself is actually absurd. There's a story of a man who dedicated his life to natural sciences, wrote down everything he could actually observe and then took his priceless collection and gave it away to the Royal Society. And the story shows that while, you know, beetles can be uh, profitably uh, 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 sort of submitted for observations, uh, true observations cannot be derived like this. And thus data-driven science is a chimera. Science needs problems, thoughts, theories, 
and designed experiments. If anything, science needs more theories and less data. Claims of objectivity and accuracy are misleading. And this is because it seems appears to hide the human behind the data. Big data doesn't magically solve problems. There are humans who are actually coming up with the algorithms um, and interpreting the data. And thus it's highly subjective and not self-explanatory. Data are collected from sensors, saved into log files, processed by computers, creating an appearance of objectivity. A controlled experiment was conducted where 29 research teams were given the same data set to analyze, and the results varied greatly. The authors attributed the variance to the fact that each research team's results were the outcome of highly subjective decisions and observations that they made during analysis. Thus data are perceived, interpreted in terms of the individual perceiver's own needs, own connotations, own personality, and own previously formed cognitive patterns. Big data are not always whole or better data. There's a misguided and a commonly propagated claim that big data are interchangeable with whole data. The world and its universe to anything or anyone with sensors is incomprehensibly big data. It is however not possible for anybody to access all the data. Case in point is Twitter, which is often used as a source representative of all people, but we know that that's not true. Having a lot of data is not the same as having all of them and cultivating such a vision of completeness is risky and misleading. On the other hand, the deluge of data causes overburdening and difficulty in grasping. The discrepancy between discovered data and collective intelligence has been increasing as can be seen from the graph on the right-hand side, where the rate of discovered data is much higher compared to the rate of collective intelligence. And the gap between the two is referred to as the information overload that cannot be conquered even with technology and eventually approaches the complexity barrier, which is essentially a situation where the effort needed to derive insights in a research field rises exponentially after or as it appears to hit a complexity threshold. This reaffirms the point that all data is really out of reach. Taken out of context, big data loses meaning. The concept of raw data itself is an oxymoron, and there really is no such thing as raw data. Data are contextualized by the process of, generation, of data generation as we've already seen in some of the earlier slides. And interestingly, there is already data distortion happening at the point of data collection. As any data that is collected are collected by an observer for a certain purpose from a distinct vantage point and with distinct methods and various tools. There's a dangerous tendency in addition to repurpose data that may lead for it to be completely taken out of context. Even a simple act of data transfer or the use of data from one seemingly re related domain to another related domain causes the change or loss in context because there may be access constraints that may have been applied or filtering logic that may have been applied on the data. And therefore, context is critically important. Context is king, it's key, it's questioned, constructed, and contested. And the, the graphic on the right demonstrates this very simple point, I thought beautifully, where there is a judge, either the prosecutor or the defense lawyer, and the person on the stand. And each of them will interpret things differently based on their observations about what the objective truth is. Accessibility does not make them ethical. Privacy as we have known is ending and it's only now that we have begun to fathom you know, truly what is actually happening. The, the fact that privacy and the concept of privacy has changed. Big data have decreased and eradicated anonymity and is facilitate, facilitating a goldfish bull society where the big brother or big tech 
choose. <laughs> Whichever you choose is actually watching. And the consequences are often unintended and can be far reaching with a number of companies acting as data brokers, providing geolocation data, combining metadata from multiple sources. And this has already led to a number of data breaches with disclosing sensitive army bases, personal healthcare data. The list is pretty long and endless. Michael Hayden, the former NSA and CIA director was incensed enough once to say, and I quote, we kill people based on metadata. There are serious ethical and privacy concerns that must be addressed. And finally, limited access to big data creates new digital divides. Big data are ubiquitous and anonymization is not entirely possible. Thus having access to data becomes a source of power. And this phenomena is referred to as the big data divide. In the context of predictive analytics, people or algorithms with access to data can potentially influence those without access. Since almost everyone generates data, but few don't have access to it or may not be able to actually have access to the full gamut of it. This leads to a social sorting where the big data divide between the haves and the have nots is created. The shift in power means Many people are growing more and more powerless when it comes to their data. They don't know what is collected, who is collecting it, and for what purpose. There will be winners and losers. There will be those who are empowered and those who are disempowered. In addition, new developments in big data increase the complexity as well as the opacity of the system and will further intensify this divide. In conclusion, we are sort of all swimming in the water of big data and dealing with something that is omnipresent. Due to their influence, big data can no longer be thought of as purely technological, but they need to be viewed as a socio-technological phenomena and also critically and carefully evaluated for their impact. I hope this makes you think and ponder a little bit. Thanks everyone. Um, let me know if there are any questions or uh, if you have any feedback from me, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rati. Um, so if anyone has any questions, like uh, feel free to add it to the chat. Uh, I would pass it on to Rati and uh, she would be happy to answer them for us. And uh, I would also be sharing the LinkedIn um, URLs or like the LinkedIn profiles of all the speakers here so you can uh, connect with them uh, thank you so much rate it was a great uh, it was a great chat from you and i really appreciate you joining us from such an odd time i i really understand how much enthusiastic you are about the field and how much it means to you to be a part of the uh, wits community so uh, thank you so much i i really appreciate and i'm uh, really uh, glad to have you here thanks for um, sure thanks for thank you time. Thank you so much. So uh, we will be going on with the next speaker. So um, Yu Yu, uh, are you there? Are you joining us? Uh, yes. Sorry. Let me see. Hi. So uh, uh, yeah, let's yes, start. With sorry, I I do have my. I think I have my slides on. Just a second. No worries. Uh, how to share the... Yeah, sure. No worries. In the meanwhile that um, Yuyu is opening up her slides, let me quickly put on Rati's LinkedIn profile. So this is Rati's profile. If anyone uh, wants to connect with her, feel free to connect. And she's a, she is a great mentor to have. Um, I have been uh, like in touch with her and been like a mentee to her for a while and she's just amazing. So if anyone wants to reach out to her, they can feel free to. Okay, uh, are you able to see my screen? Yeah, thank, thank you. 
Sure, let me give a quick introduction of myself. So my name is yep. Yuyu. I'm a director of data science at uh, Bank of New York Mellon and um, using machine learning and data science to solve business problems is my day job. Today I will talk a little bit about the different application of data science in finance. And I will start with some high level practical insights on the data scientist skill set and um, how a typical data science job session look like. This is more for people who are aspiring to be data scientists, practicing data scientists, if you are the one, I guess there's, that's just state of obvious. So data science as a field has gained popularity in the last five to 10 years. Many people who were in adjacent areas got put in depending on which direction people got put in, they may be strong in one direction or another. I think it's important for us to try to acquire the skills that was not in our original skill set. My, uh, myself, for example, I was having mathematics and statistics background and the areas I acquired later on are domain knowledge and to some extent hacking skills because statistics is not exactly the same as uh, computer science. But um, definitely if there's no attempt to acquire domain knowledge when we apply machine learning or data science to a problem that can be dangerous. I used to work in AIG science, which is um, a independent research group within an insurance company. Some of my colleagues who also come with pure technical background, when they apply machine learning methods directly to insurance without taking into account the constraints and nuances, they definitely, uh, I would say the direction of their conclusions could be entirely wrong, just because you do not um, understand the context. And some of these are subtle, just to give you an example, uh, people find that um, the accident rate has decreased in the this fitting sample. Therefore, their model follow that suggestion and give recommendation of uh, how much rate you should charge for the new policies. However, the data sample was fit in uh, economic expanding. Uh, I think a, a recession somewhat period when the period they apply it on is an expanding period. And in a recession period, the drivers in this case is auto policy. So the drivers, they are running out of jobs. So whoever is remaining are experienced and have long time experience with driving. So their accidents are not very high. But when you have an economic expanding period, you the companies hire a lot of new drivers or people who have less experience and less training. So they tend to have accident, accidents a lot more. You cannot assume your data distribution is staying constant, but some of these knowledge require you to understand how the business is run and what exactly you are analyzing, not just what you see in the data. As for what the real job look like, I think many people have this impression when they are attending school or when they learn the machine learning courses, it's all about tuning algorithms and applying the new shining technique that is upcoming. When they join the job, they realize most of the time goes into cleaning data and trying to resolve the discrepancies of data sources from one to another or like a clean things that doesn't make any sense or trying to even find where the data is within a large organization and trying to find the data dictionary and all that. Actual refining the algorithm according to this plot is only 4% of the time. Of course, the specific breakdown differ by job, but for most of the data scientists or machine learning, the scientists, that is the reality. So it doesn't mean data cleaning is and collecting data is not important, it's very important, but uh, the expectation definitely need to be adjusted. And if uh, you hand the data cleaning job to someone else, it might uh, allow you to focus on more interesting part, but if they make some decisions upstream, 
it can alter your conclusion downstream. So even if it is not done by the same person, it needs to be closely monitored. As for the application of machine learning in finance, they are numerous. Uh, I myself has been in asset management and um, touched the pricing and fraud detection, some of the regulatory and so on, but happy to go into any directions if needed during the chat and follow up. But the point is there are a lot of applications in all directions, not just the coolest aspect, but uh, some of the mundane ones as well. And they can make a difference in people's lives. I think some of the panelists would focus on certain areas, but definitely in finance, there are a lot of uh, concern of privacy and uh, ethics and how it is to use in decision-making and what it means to regulators, especially with machine learning algorithms. A lot of them are lack of explainability compared to the traditional methods. They may be more accurate if you just talk about uh, training sample RMSE or precision versus recall, but if things go wrong, can you explain what goes wrong? And if you make decisions for other individuals, such as loan applications, credit card, or rate adjustment based on big data and algorithms, can you explain to people why they are approved or denied? And whether there are some biases in the sample that cause you to discriminate against certain subsets of people, those are all definitely concerns that uh, can't be measured by accuracy alone. Last point, I think people are definitely curious about how alternative data or machine learning or data science can be used to better manage money. I think some of the panelists probably are still practicing it. I used to practice this when I was in a hedge fund. So just to give you some flavor, in recent years, there has been a huge surge in the alternative data providers and the amount and quantity of data being gathered from all directions. So just to qualify or maybe take a giant step back, how was the uh, research done before all these alternative data become available? So from fundamental investment perspective, we are talking about the uh, stock picking and try to make money from stock picking, like judging which companies prices will go up, which, which company is a good company versus a bad one. So there are systematic and fundamental approach. Fundamental approach, people generally believe the stock prices are driven by the fundamentals, meaning whether a company is a money-making company and whether they will continue to make money in the future. What's the systematic is probably just look at the price and volume, trading volume patterns and see where it will go. And you can separate by different frequency of trading and so on. So the direction or the background I was working in is more fundamental driven. So we were trying to use alternative data in combination with uh, what was traditionally disclosed by the company themselves through the quarterly or annual reports to help investors decide whether the underlying company, company underlying a particular stock is doing well or not, or will do well in the future or not. So those are, so the financials disclosed by the companies themselves are considered, um, I guess, the traditional data. Alternative data is just any data you gather yourself that is not from the company and is not from sell side, meaning the sell side investment banks. So they ha have different flavors. It could be credit card panels, it could be web scraping, it could be email receipt, it could be um, click stream, satellite images, other things you can think of. And they are being used by at least the largest hedge funds, the ones that can afford purchasing the data and ha can have large data science teams that process these data. And more and more asset managers express interest in them. However, the, the most useful ones may not be what you think. For example, if you read the um, public media, there were a lot of discussion of um, all companies or hedge funds are using satellite images to analyze which retailer's parking lot is for or not. Uh, when we try to use it within a hedge fund, it's very difficult to use because if you think about it, 
the satellites, they actually do not see every parking lot clearly and it depends on how often the satellite monitor a certain parking lot. And if you look at the parking lot, it could be shared by nearby office space and retailers. And if the parking lot is under a garage, you don't see them. If there are clouds on the sky, you can't see it. And in some cases, the satellite only pass a location once a month. So using that to track foot traffic is a very rough indicator. So the, there are definitely pretty interesting things going on, but, but generally speaking, you can get some sense of the revenue or sentiment of retail companies from the alternative data and people do monetize from them. Maybe I'll pause here to see. I don't know, did I take up my allocated time or should I <laughs> say some more? Go ahead, you, you, it's okay. I'm a little early. Yeah, so maybe yeah. I can tell one or two more anecdotal stories. So one typical thing company used to use, let's say credit card and email receipt data to track company performance is they identify, let's say you want to invest in Starbucks and you want to know whether they sold more coffee or any related stuff or not in the upcoming quarter. You just uh, do text matches so first of all, you have to figure out which transactions are done by Starbucks customers. So you can do text matches within the credit card panel to see which transaction is paid towards Starbucks. And then you see, you can just add them up by month or by day to see are the sales trending up or down. But it's not as simple because some of the credit card panels size changes. These go down to statistics. If you track more people, the sales will go up, but it doesn't mean Starbucks sold more. It might just mean you expanded your panel. So this panel normalization has to go on all the time. And sometimes it's getting disrupted. I don't know whether Starbucks has their own store credit card, but some retailers is customary for them to say, if you sign up for their credit card, they give you 10% off. So if uh, suddenly there is an uptick in the store credit card and usually those cards are not part of the credit card panel, you will see uh, the sales potentially staying flat or go down within your credit card panel. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean the company sold less stuff. It just means you lose track of some people. So you have to normalize for that. And, and Similar things happen to email receipt data. For example, at one point, Gmail decide they are no longer part of the panel. So you have a sharp drop in the number of people participating. The remaining people, well, if you think of the population, most of the young and I guess tech savvy people use Gmail. If you take out Gmail, who you left are Google, I mean, Yahoo and some other obscure email providers. So that just affect the representativeness of your panel. So things like that would all be what uh, users worry about, but there are creative ways to patch up for what you like and still glean insight from the alternative data. So I think I'll stop here. Happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much, Yoyo. That was an amazing session. And um, in a very funny way, there's a little bit of overlap with, with what I'm gonna present. <laughs> so that's gonna be very funny, but thank you so much like for covering a lot of, a lot of interesting insights. And thank you for presenting that it is indeed a, uh, one of the most important features that being a data scientist doesn't just mean, uh, you know, being in computer science or being in tech, it does have a lot to do with having the domain understanding because uh, a data scientist uh, has to not just perceive a business problem just from a computer science perspective, but they need to understand how the business runs, how the uh, how the uh, organization uh, structures, right? So that's, that's very important. So thank you, Yuyu, for uh, mentioning that. Um, so we will be uh, going ahead with uh, our next speaker. Hi, Claudia. Are you ready? I'm ready. I hope I'm unmuted for once. Okay. 
yes, which I you usually are. <laughs> forget to do. <laughs> well, um, I'm going to quickly put up your uh, LinkedIn uh, URL into the chat. So anyone good. who wants yes. to connect with you uh, can do that. Great. Okay, so let me uh, let me start um, actually by sure. introducing myself. Um, <clears throat> so, um, sorry, I'm no longer a chief scientist. I used to be. Now I'm uh, an SVP of strategic data science, also working in finance at Two Sigma. Um, and my background, I came to data science from uh, the computer science uh, um, uh, background, and I stumbled into my first uh, um, course on artificial neural networks in '95 long before there was big data and a lot of hype around being a data scientist. But I've always been very much interested in building predictive models. And I wanna share some perspective on, um, I feel is, is often a undervalued skill set in, um, uh, in the education that we have in data science. So I'm also, aside from my day job, I'm working as an adjunct uh, at NYU, uh, teaching a course on machine learning. And one of the things I found uh, really hard to communicate are some of the experiences I have had with machine learning. And so uh, I've, I've titled my talk somewhat uh, uh, provocatively as Beware of Predictability. Um, and I think there are a lot of connections and parallels to the previous two talks that we had by Rati and Yu Yu in terms of the things that might go wrong. Um, and I will take a kind of very concrete set of examples of, of things I feel uh, are difficult to learn um, and are something that I've been um, often with limited success looking for in, um, in applicants for job roles uh, that uh, I've interviewed. So. Specifically, what I want to talk about um, is a phenomena called leakage uh, in some circles. Um, and um, I have a uh, selected a couple of examples for it. And the most obvious case here um, is, a, is a trivial one. What leakage is, uh, in my mind, is there was something in either the data collection process or in the data pre-processing uh, um, piece that leads to information that is very predictive or can be predictive, but really shouldn't be there. And it leads you to believe that your model is an awful lot better than it ultimately will be. So this is a very trivial and somewhat construed uh, problem where let's assume you have given a data set like this one, um, and you for some reason decide that you would like to build a model to uh, classify people by gender, so male or female. Now. If you look through this data uh, kind of closely, there should be one column that should draw your ire. And if you spend some time going through it, what you should observe is that while you have a target variable on gender, but there is something right here. And if you look at it closely, it suggests that this group variable has in fact your target variable embedded in it. So everything that starts with M as an age group is male and F is female. So clearly that model won't be terribly useful and it will be trivially perfect, but um, it's not a model that I would uh, want to use for anything or even draw insights from. Um, now that might seem very obvious here, um, but um, in general, this happens in many very surprising ways many of which are extremely hard to discover. And it goes back to um, how much understanding do you have about the context of your data collection and how closely are you involved in the data processing? As Rati said, there's a lot of time spent there. And I personally feel very strongly about, I want to do my own data cleaning for exactly those issues. So let's go to a slightly more um, interesting example. Um, and let's assume for, for this case that a um, large online uh, uh, store is interested in uh, increasing cross-selling, meaning uh, they're trying to find people that they should target for jewelry um, because there's a lot of profit margin, say in jewelry, and you're trying to find out who of your current customers might also be in, interested in jewelry. Um, and typically what you start from is some kind of transaction level information. So you have all of this data that is automatically recorded in your system where for every purchase you have a date and a customer ID and a product category and some price. 
Now, the first piece that data science entails is you need to actually get from there to a training data set. Um, and so when you just have this transaction level data, that's obviously not something we want to work with. What we need to get to is to have a representation of customers. So you may think about how do I create kind of customer level information? And you could think about aggregating kind of their historical transactions on the revenue based on the different categories that they made their purchases. And you end up with something like this, right? I mean, somewhat straightforward. You probably don't need the customer ID in there, but it's good to have in the data uh, creation process. And the question now is, is this an appropriate data set to build a cross-selling model, meaning to predict whether or not somebody bought jewelry because that's the one group we kept out and just have an indicator. Seems straightforward enough. Well, something interesting happens. You get a model that's very, very good. And if you analyze it and try to understand it's what it's doing, one weird thing shows up. It basically says that um, the more people buy, the lower the probability of buying jewelry, which is not probably what you expected to see. Now, is that true? You're probably going to stumble about a very particular case where, in fact, if they have spent exactly zero dollars across all other categories, then you have a 100% chance that they buy jewelry. Meaning if people buy nothing else, then they are a very good prospect for jewelry. Is that true? Maybe. But what actually happened here is something very different. What happened is that when you created your data, you only looked at customer you already had. And there's a group of customers that only bought jewelry. So if they are in your sample and they have not bought anything else, they must have bought jewelry in order to be in your sample but you don't have any of the people who didn't buy anything else and didn't buy jewelry because they never made it into your customer database. And by doing so, you created a fake signal that the total sum of purchases, if it is zero, it's a perfect predictor of jewelry. Now, if you think about this more deeply, what you're really lying uh, is, first off, you will not be able to detect this problem with out of sample evaluation, because chances are your random subset that you're doing evaluation on has the exact same problem as your training data. Um, so we need to look at the context of what we're trying to do here um, to be able to prevent this from happening. Because otherwise we build models that then when you put them to use are likely to underperform significantly. So the key problem we had is we weren't really good about thinking about time. And that's a very important component of setting up predictive models, especially in finance, where we're very careful with timing in general. And the important piece here is to understand that there is a time period where you have information that you can use for features and to create your training sample. There's a decision you're making, like sending out the targeting. Um, and then anything that happens afterwards is off limits for your creation process of your data set. Um, and what's often challenging is the fact that the time until your target variable is known is much later than your decision process. So let's try to apply this framework to another task um, that's quite commonly picked up by my MBA students when I ask them to go and find a nice project to work on. Um, let's see if that helps us understand what's going here, but better. Um, and so here, typical um, risk in, in finance, you're trying to predict loan default. Um, so in order to score appropriately the risk of a loan, you need to get an estimate of the probability of default. And what you typically have is a whole bunch of uh, past loans that are in your CRM system. By the way, you can get data like this from Lending Club if you want to play around with it. Um, and that typically looks something like this. You have information about each and every loan, the person who applied, their FICO score, their location, their age, maybe you know something about their employment history, but you get something like this. All right, now if you wanna go from here to build a model to predict default, what are we going to pay attention to? Well, the first thing is you need to observe that 
the outstanding value, meaning the amount of money that hasn't been paid back yet, is not something you know when you need to make the decision, meaning handing out the loan. So this column here that I just grayed out is clearly called leakage. It happened after the decision time and you have to remove it. Now, what else do we need to pay attention to? There's something else kind of glaringly obvious. Um, there is this guy in Alabama, right? So you also have the issue that sometimes in your database, you don't know the target yet. So in this case here, the loan is still ongoing. They might be paying it back, they may not be, so it's pending. So you wanna remove that from your sample. Are we good? Is there anything else that could go wrong here? Well, I would be careful and ask very specifically whether the FICO score that you have is actually recorded as of the time that the loan was handed out and not appended later because FICO scores change. And so if somebody is in default, then maybe that FICO score actually reflects the current credit worthiness, which was affected by the loan that you're trying to learn from. So you have to make sure that this is as of the time of the application. So that's a question mark. Go back to talk to the person who collected the data. All right, are we good? Is this where the story ends? Well, not quite. That now might look like a good data set, but something interesting is going to happen. Um, if you now run a model on this, you will realize that you just created a fake signal because all of the more recent loans have a higher chance of being a default. It will look like as if loans have become more risky recently. Why is that? Well, the higher probability of default in the more recent zone happen because if I only look at loans where I know the outcome, you can default a lot faster than you can pay back your loan meaning all the loans that we pay, uh, were paid back are probably older. And the loans that you have very recently, the only way you would know the target variable is if they had defaulted. Now you could say, why would I have the date in there as a feature? You probably wouldn't, but there are many correlated other features potentially with time that still carry those leaked pieces of information and will distort your model and will make it look current applications overall much more risky. So what I want you to think about is that creating an appropriate training set for machine learning out in the wild when you start with quote transaction level data is really an art. And there is a lot of skepticism and questioning to it. It is not something that you can detect with any of the skills they teach you on cross-validation and avoiding and overfitting. It's an entirely context-specific problem, but being able to detect it is a super important skill and having that intuition of what can go wrong. And it really goes back to the talks we had around the data robustness, the collection robustness, and how much understanding you have of that. And my final point, and I think that was also something that Rati said is, you have to look at modeling and data processing and pre-processing and collection in combination of the use you're intending it for. And it's very much, it's very important that you keep governance across all of these pieces in order to get reliably good performing models. So that's my little story from the trenches of data science. Uh, thank you very much. And, um, I'm not sure if you already posted my LinkedIn uh, um, uh, connection, but feel free for everybody to reach out to me uh, and I'm happy to answer questions later or in our um, discussion session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia. What you mentioned today, like uh, actually, uh, sticks back to a lot of memory for me because uh, whenever I got to work in uh, financial industries, that was the first thing which I got to learn. Like uh, when looking at the finance, like the use cases, I had to sit with the domain experts for like long hours to understand like each and every feature variables to understand like why is it there in the first place and why is it even required for the analysis? If that data is something which they are getting probably after they understand the decision variable or they uh, or they do get it before. 
before because um, often like I have personally seen that uh, once we build certain models, they get like uh, extremely high accuracy. And we have been wondering that uh, that's pretty much very like, uh, you know, unusual to have such high percentages mm -hmm. of accuracy on the models. And that's when we realize that there are a lot of data leakages. So that's like literally one of the most important uh, topics you just touched because as a data scientist, it is extremely important important that you understand your data well before getting into modeling part so uh like thank you so much this was like really helpful and it gave me a lot of insights on um how to even like use dates because dates is something which i was also curious about like why is it important like is it important like it's just numbers right so date has something uh date is something which has made me curious as well in the past about how well is it going to be useful in my modeling phase so this was like really very useful thank you so much claudia i did put your uh linkedin url on the in the chat so anyone who wants to connect can feel free to connect with Claudia. Uh, she posts a lot of stuff on LinkedIn and she is uh, she's really active on uh, posting about latest news as well about uh, financial data science. So feel free to follow her there. Great. Um, so I guess um, I will wait if people have any questions. Uh, I am actually not seeing any questions here on the Zoom chat. There might be questions coming up in the uh, in the YouTube chat. So we can uh, have that for the data science panel in the end. Um, and I would probably go ahead and share my screen. Okay, hang in there. Just after my presentation, you can have a 15 minute break. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Just someone can confirm if it's visible. Okay, perfect. So uh, I actually wanted to talk about this for a really long time and I was just trying to find for the right opportunity. Auto AI is like one of my favorite uh, projects coming in from IBM. Um, this is something which I have used a lot and uh, like I feel like just the concept of automated AI is really fascinating and uh, it, it has time and again shown me that how important it is to automate things and not reinvent the wheel, how important it is to uh, channelize our focus on, on the things which is more important, that is the use case and the domain expertise, rather than uh, focusing on like coding and the redundant things that we often see in data science and machine learning. So this is something which is really close to my heart. And uh, I am a data scientist in uh, data science elite team. So a quick introduction about me. Uh, I joined IBM in 2018 and uh, I am a part of the data science elite team. Uh, my team works really uh, closely with the IBM research because our uh, motive is to uh, like introduce all the organizations and infuse artificial intelligence in their organization. So we want all the industries to adopt uh, AI in their workflow and, um, you know, transform their businesses using machine learning and automation. So that's why we really clo uh, work closely with the IBM research team. And the topic which I'm gonna talk about today is auto AI, which is also a brainchild of IBM research. Um, I have a master's in data science from Columbia University. I graduated in 2018 and um, I have been recently uh, spotlighted in uh, LinkedIn as a top voice for data science and AI. Uh, I am a big advocate of uh, women in data science and uh, most of my LinkedIn posts would be around latest technologies. It would be focusing on what, what do we see, what's the next trend uh, in data science and AI and where can we, uh, you know, how can people channelize their interests and thoughts if they are interested in data science and how can they um, uh, perform like more researches or uh, should they be in like tech leadership, etc. So that's something I often post about. Um, my background is in computer science. So that's, that's something uh, again, like, which has fascinated me a lot about data science, because uh, people often think that data science is closely related to computer science, but it is absolutely not. To be honest, if data science is at all connected to anything, it is a uh, as diverse as you can think of it. It is a part of every, every industry. It is a uh, part of every organization and every businesses can incorporate data science in their workflow. So that's something which I have learned through my uh, career journey. I am um, a researcher and I mostly, uh, my one of my fascinating interests is uh, automated AI and uh, reinforcement learning. Um, 
So that's something I, I really like to research about. I like to read about. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I would go ahead and show one of the images. You might have just seen this like 30 minutes ago when um, you, you was presenting. So uh, why I had this image for my presentation is to show that uh, it data science is an amalgam of computer science, mathematics, and dom uh, domain knowledge. So what we see in automation is something which we can do with computer science with respect to coding. And uh, to some extent, we can do that with like mathematics and statistics because a lot of the optimizers um, and a lot of the uh, pipeline which is used in data science is something which can be automated. But what is something extremely unique and extremely precious about each and every use case that is solved in AI or data science is the domain knowledge. As um, Rati mentioned, as uh, Yuyu mentioned, and as Claudia just mentioned, like it is extremely important for a person solving a data science problem in any industry to have in-depth understanding of the data. And that's where the domain knowledge comes into play because uh, we really need people who can understand and can um, validate how different uh, pieces of information in a data set can influence the entire use case. So uh, that's something which uh, is very hard to uh, automate, right? So with automated AI, a lot of researchers have been trying to automate the two other sections uh, in data science, that is like computer science and mathematics. These are something which have been uh, evolved in all these years and they have matured to a level that uh, these could be automated. So that's where we started producing automated AI or automated uh, machine learning, as you may call it, uh, to help or to assist the data scientists and researchers all across the globe uh, where they are easily able to adopt data science in their workflow. Because if you have your domain knowledge, if you are a trader, if you are a financial analyst, uh, what is missing for you to incorporate machine learning in your workflow? those might be computer science and mathematics. And that's something which can be automated. And that's something which IBM Research had been working on for all, all these years. And uh, they have come up with this uh, amazing uh, piece of software called Auto AI, which helps you do this. And I personally, I'm a data scientist who works with uh, different clients. So each of my engagements are with different industries. Uh, in, the, in the past, I have worked with financial industries, health industries, governmental agencies, uh, international governmental agencies uh, for that matter. Um, so in all these situations, what I could understand is that to some extent, the, uh, the coding piece in machine learning is something which is redundant, right? The data processing, uh, how to choose the model, how to do the, um, how to do the pre-processing for the data, how to uh, do feature engineering, et cetera, are something which is a streamlined process and very well could be automated. And using auto AI simplified my life a lot because I was more focusing on the data aspect of it rather than doing the uh, coding or like the uh, redundant part in the, in the field of data science. So, um, why care about automation? Uh, so this is really important because when, uh, as we have been mentioning repeatedly that it's really important for us to understand the data and doing feature engineering, understanding the features on how they affect the business, how they would be impacting the use case is really important. And that's where we want data scientists to be spending more time on the data and less time on the process. So that's, uh, that's pretty much the motivation behind auto AI. So auto AI is pretty much built on uh, three major, like three major uh, pillars. So what they want to do is we should be able to apply the machine learning use cases in every real world problem. Like wherever somebody wants to solve, they should be able to handily use uh, machine learning. And the second thing is whatever is a pipeline or whatever is a process that should be able to be automated. And the third thing is, as I mentioned uh, earlier, that subject matter expertise um, is very important for different industries. And these experts, uh, you could be a trader, you could be a doctor, you could be a, um, a surgeon, right? Uh, so all the, all the people who are not from a coding background or not from a mathematical background and who have really thorough understanding in their own domain should also be able to um, incorporate machine learning in their workflow whenever they need it. So these were like the major three motivations behind building auto AI.
So uh, when we have to talk about the entire workflow of a, uh, a AI model, we start from like understanding the and getting the data. Then we do some basic data cleaning. And then we go ahead with data engineering. That's basically the pre-processing of the data, uh, like removing the outliers, uh, imputing the missing values, trying to understand um, on which data might be an anomaly uh, and um, doing the right preparation on them. Then going ahead with model selection um, on what might be the right model to be applied in a particular use case. And then with parameter optimization, which is also known as hyperparameter tuning, uh, then building ensemble models where uh, you might feel that one particular set of models is not the right solution. So you can uh, ensemble different models, uh, going ahead with model validation, model deployment, runtime monitoring, and model improvement. So all this is like the entire life cycle of a machine learning model in a organization. But uh, what Auto AI is focusing on is just the just the basic three process oriented uh, process oriented workflow within this entire scheme, uh, and we would just be trying to focus on how can we do the automation of data pre processing, model selection, and the optimization of the model. So going ahead, I would uh, probably talk about like these three sections in auto AI. Auto AI compasses of these three sub modules. One sub module is for the automation of data processing. Uh, mine, like it's uh, again a note that each and every of these three modules are novel approaches and they have been built by IBM researchers. Uh, so the data pre-processing is the first module in auto AI, which uh, helps you analyze screen and pre prepare the data. So what's happening here is that it would help you um, do the um, processing like uh, missing value imputation. A lot of the models do not support missing values uh, when you're trying to build them. So it would let you do missing value imputation. It would let you do the scaling of the data because some of the data features could be within the range of say zero to five, whereas some of the values could be in millions. So because of these uh, uh, unscaled data, uh, the models might not be performing the best. So doing all these pre-processing, which we learned as a uh, basic feature in data science is automatically done in auto AI. So all this effort you're saving up on that time and you would have more time to put into research on the use case and how it's going to create a business impact in the organization. The second thing in uh, auto AI is the automated feature engineering. So once we are done with the basic data cleaning and pre-processing, the second feature, the second most important thing in the data science workflow is feature engineering. That is something which is, uh, which is a really important uh, task for any data scientist. And we spend a lot of time understanding this because just a quick example, if we were to see, uh, and I had to build a linear boundary uh, for a data. And if the data itself, uh, the actual value of the data itself is not linear, right? Then I might not be able to build that linear boundary. Uh, let's say we are talking about a data which looks closely to a concentric circle. And we are trying to build a model that is supposed to be a linear, linear separable model. How would I build it efficiently in a concentric circled data? Uh, one of the feature engineering in this case would be to, uh, uh, you know, like, extrapolate it in two different dimensions. So uh, we can get the smaller concentric circle and the bigger concentric circle in two different planes. And the uh, the middle plane which we divide these two concentric circles could be our linear separable boundary model. So these particular uh, sort of feature engineering techniques like uh, applying a tan theta on, on your data or applying a sine uh, on your data, et cetera, are something which data scientists spend a lot of time on. And uh, for them to do the redundant process between uh, taking the data, applying a particular feature engineering and confirming if it does has a better uh, accuracy for your model is a time consuming process and it's an iterative process. So uh, 
all that part is automated in the uh, in the auto ai where it does this exhaustive search in a structured way and tries to understand that based on the data what would be the best feature engineering and how does that have an effect on the on the model uh, accuracy so that's something which is again a novel approach coming in from ibm research and the way it is done is in a sequential approach so there are some of the uh, some of the of uh, feature engineering which are done in parallel versus sequential approach on how do we uh, segregate the data into different streamlines and apply these feature engineering and serially try to see how these feature engineering have an impact on the model accuracy then the third uh, feature in the auto ai is the model selection model selection is also uh, one of the most important uh, categorizations in data science because uh, with every uh, with every time period going ahead there are new researchers which come about new algorithms like uh, in the recent past we have got like light light gbm xg boost etc cat boost etc so all these new algorithms have been time and again proving that uh, algorithms and their optimization parameters can be fine tuned and can be uh, uh, worked on from from them to be working better with different kinds of data and with all the uh, incoming uh, model researchers which we see in the market uh, it is also a very important uh, task for us to understand the right kind of data right kind of model to be selected for your data some models might be re requiring as simple as a logistic regression whereas some models might be needing a random forest versus some models might be needing a cat boost etc so why each each and every different model is right for your data is also important for you to know because some data is linearly separable some is not some is uh, divided uh, on a certain angle of the plane uh, so in understanding all these uh, about your data might be really time consuming and that is something which is automatically done in uh, in auto ai and uh, auto ai uses reinforcement learning uh, algorithms to process all these different models and do the hyperparameter optimization on those models so what's happening in the hyperparameter optimization is that it's trying to uh, fetch the right model first so once it has selected the model let's say we the uh, the auto ai has chosen xg boost then the second approach would for uh, for the auto ai is to tune these uh, hyperparameters within the xg boost model so within the xg boost model it would be uh, running uh, searches and it would be dividing your data into subsets and like uh, like various different subsets and trying to run your model in in these various subsets of data and uh, in a parallel approach it would be able to understand on which direction uh, is the accuracy or like in which direction is the um, decision boundary of the model moving and uh, based on that it would be tuning the hyperparameters in a certain way initially it would be doing it in on a big scale where it's uh, changing the hyperparameter by a, a factor delta and the delta would be changing to a smaller number as in when it's able to understand the movement of the uh, decision boundary of the model in a certain direction so uh, these are like the main factors which are incorporated in auto ai and uh, personally i have been using this uh, software in my uh, day to day job and it has helped me a lot as a data scientist uh, and saving my time also uh, another interesting feature about auto ai which i found is that uh, whenever you're running an auto ai experiment on your data not only does it uh, do all these different operations but it also exports Uh, a jupyter notebook by the end of the experiment so each and everything that i just mentioned about like data imputation um, missing value uh, about like anomaly detection about feature engineering about hyperparameter optimization or model selection each and every of these things come to you as a python code so it becomes extremely easy for you as a data scientist also to learn through these things because uh, whenever i see these jupyter notebooks it makes me curious about oh well i never thought about uh, applying this sort of a feature engineering that's something new i learned right so that in that way it has also helped me uh, broaden my vision on what would be the best kind of feature engineering and different kinds of data
And uh, if I were to like uh, summarize everything that we spoke today, um, the main purpose of auto AI here is that it's helping you as a data scientist reduce the time that you're spending on repetitive work on anything that is redundant so that you have more clear focus on the domain expertise or like understanding the data and how it creates a business value uh, in the real world problem or in any organization. And when you're doing this, you're spending more time and your, your uh, value delivered through your modeling is uh, more worth. And in the entire data science modeling process, it is a faster turnaround time because uh, most of the redundant stuff that you would probably have spent, let's say five days to do a data pre-processing is now done in like 30 minutes. So in, uh, in a end-to-end -end approach, it saves a lot of time for you and also gives you a lot of uh, time to focus on the research aspect of it and understanding the business value uh, coming in from your data science problem. So that is uh, pretty much what I had for today. Uh, I would be open to any of the questions that you guys have. And if you would want to try auto AI, it is, um, it is available for free for you guys to try. Um, I can probably put in the link uh, using which you can access the trial version and uh, have your hands on. And uh, thank you so much. If you guys have any questions, you can uh, probably reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, I am active on both these platforms and would uh, love to hear from you guys. So, uh, yep, that's pretty much all I had. Let me go back, stop sharing my screen. Great. Um, I would probably assume that Every one of you is pretty much exhausted with all the information that we just uh, gave you. So let's go on a quick 15 minute break and come back. Uh, yep. In the meanwhile, if you guys have any questions, feel free to put it on the chat. I would be just drinking coffee sitting right here. So I would be happy to answer your questions and I'll see you guys in 15 minutes. So we are going to assemble back around 225 if that's good for everyone. Okay, perfect. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Great. So we would be coming back and continuing the session. Um, so the next speaker we have on the list is Marlene. Say hi, Marlene. <laughs> hi. Hi, so I'll be speaking some... when we get back. Yeah, and uh, a little information about Marlene. She works on Instagram and I have visited her office. It's amazing. So uh, I am really excited to hear more from you, Marlene. <laughs> it was amazing. It now was my so office amazing. is it. <laughs> I, was, I was super jealous after visiting your office, Marlene. It has the best coffee makers in the world. <laughs> Yeah, sadly, we okay. haven't been there in more than nine months. So I've gotten used yeah, to right? not so good coffee. <laughs> yep, I have also been using my French press, but not the best coffee. But yeah, it does we the job. Do it. <laughs> okay, great. So uh, let's actually meet around 2.30. If that's best for everyone, we'll see you, Mali. Great. That's perfect, yeah. So perfect. So see you guys in the in at two thirty. Bye. Uh, by the way, I'm gonna keep the Zoom open. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to put it on uh, on the chat, and the uh, Zoom call will be uh, still uh, active. Great.
So I can't hear anything. I don't know why, if we lost our fearless leader. Uh, I'm here. Can you hear me, Claudia? Yes. So we said like 225. So I, I guess uh, if you wanted, you could just go ahead. I'm not sure if there are technical difficulties. Uh, I think Ishwarya said 230 at the end. Yeah, we oh, I see. 230. Oh, I see. Yeah. I, I'm, I lost Just in a last. minute. Claudia is very eager to hear you, Merlene, and so am I. Yes, I can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> no pressure. Hmm. Hey, am I audible? Perfect. Welcome back. I hope you guys have had your nice short break. Um, so we're going to start with Marlene. Hi, Marlene. Uh, could you uh, probably like start with a short introduction about yourself and go ahead with your presentation? Uh, yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. Uh, let me just share my screen. Can you all see it? Cool. Okay. So this is, thank you. So I am Marlene Garib. Uh, this is my title slide and it's a handful. So hopefully I'll explain everything I mean by this, but let me start with a little bit about me. Um, my name, as I said, is Marlene. I am currently a data scientist on the Instagram home team. And I work mostly with the stories around ranking algorithm these days. So my job is basically to steward, interpret, and improve a single AI algorithm that determines which stories people want to watch. I consider myself first and foremost a social scientist. Uh, my first degree is in economics and my PhD is in political science, where I worked on game theory models to understand what determines how people share evidence in adversarial contexts. In my career in industry, I've worked at Facebook, Instagram, and Oscar Health. So I've straddled the world between consumer facing algorithms and data science in healthcare in general. So today I'd like to use my time with you guys to think together about the nature of the events that I've spent the last few years trying to predict. 
Hopefully I can make you think, you all think a little bit about our role in understanding different applications of AI and especially the role that behavioral intuition and good modeling has on a data science career. Uh, I also have a lot of overlap with what Claudia said and with, Aishwari, with what Ashwarya said. So I hope you find this uh, sort of on topic. So what do Tinder, Instagram, YouTube, AdWords, Amazon, and that email you got from your credit card company asking you if you really bought three ice creams on the same day have in common? So they're all consumer facing algorithms. They all make money. They all use AI. They're all personalized. But to make obvious the most fundamental thing that they have in common is that at their core, all these algorithms are based on predicting discrete events. There are events that be depend on human behavior that either haven't happened or are still unknown. So this is gonna be largely the topic of my talk. These are events that are uh, predictive, behavioral, individual and Bayesian. This is largely my kind of data sciences, of data science. And I want to sort of reflect on what each one of these four things means. And hopefully by the end of my talk, I will have left you with a little bit of the feeling of what our biggest problems are with this particular kinds of problems. So why are they predictive? Because at the risk of sending obvious, we're predicting past or known behaviors Based, sorry, we're using data on past or known behaviors to predict future or unknown events. A little bit linking to Claudia's talk, this will become very important when we can predict things with 100% accuracy, right? Like if your best friend, your mother, and yourself couldn't do it for a single event in your life, how can a computer do it for a large scale event, right? So that's where we start sniffing around and know that something's wrong which leads me to the fact that they're behavioral. So they involve humans, which means there's free will and cognitive processes. So just let's be wary of how much we are going to have to predict these events and how, what exactly are we getting at, right? Like there is an algorithm that is trying to approximate what a person is doing in a very nebulous cognitive process, like sort of, for example, deciding which stories to watch or when to stop sharing their, like when to stop uh, viewing their stories viewer on Instagram. They're also individual events. So not, we're not predicting stuff like inflation or like the unemployment rate, right? Which where uh, individual events average out and we're predicting large trends. These are mostly single decisions, like whether a person will swipe on Tinder or atomic interactions, like whether people will uh, interact in social media that we're trying to predict. So let's like remember that uh, confidence intervals and error rates will depend on this very, very individual events. And finally, maybe the most complicated one is their Bayesian. So they're always based on priors, hypotheses and conditionals. Perhaps also relating this to Claudia's talk, what are the priors that we have in our data set, in our prediction, and in our definition of what we're going after? Is the probability that you land in my data set conditioned completely on a previous event? And does that like mess up all of my inferences before that? So this is a little nebulous, but I'd like to talk about some specific typology of these events and also my experience in them. So I've roughly worked in two big areas of these PBIB events that I want to call. So one of them is like what people want. So basically you have recommender systems and ad tech. And if this seems like few examples, like recommender systems, systems encompass from dating apps to Netflix, to Instagram, to all of social media, and perhaps also slightly ad techs, which is like recommending ads for serious things. So maybe uh, for certain events too. And then the other type is events that are largely trying to determine what happened and why. So fraud detection, healthcare, and many education uh, applications are largely trying to, event, to determine whether an event happened in the real world as opposed to in the data world. And we're trying to use data to make that inference. So why are these two uh, definitions or this typology relevant? Because it has to do with a lot of the questions that we can ask about these things. So think, for example, if an event already happened, did it happen in real life and is my data complete? Or is the main challenge to know the value of the event? Because in events that don't happen in real life, that happen in the data, we know if it happened with a certainty of one. Like in social media, we know like 
whether people liked or didn't like certain media and that we know for sure. We just don't know what the value of that event is and can we compare it to other events? And finally, does our data correctly identify what's going on? So is are our features in our models capturing most of the information of why this event happened or is about to happen? So to go into the actual examples here, let's go into the first typology and what the challenges I think are the main ones are. So what do users want? Recommender systems at Facebook and Instagram. So I'll, as you all know, Recommender systems are one large type of AI problems. YouTube, Netflix, Spotify, and us all have a similar version of the same task, which in our case is make sure people see what they want to see, whether that's posts from family and friends or news articles or videos from pages they follow. For this, we use ranking, which is a set of algorithms or maybe a single algorithm that we use to try to assess how interested people are in each story they see in our platforms. So we have signals like who posted the story or how old this is or what kind of phone you're on based on other people's behavior and or past events that we use to build predictions for events where the events that we're interested in is how likely are you to comment, to share or to like a story. So let's relate that to predicting discrete events here. So we built these algorithms using state-of-the-art AI that we open source and continuously improve. And that's where like all the jargon comes in but what is the actual job of the data scientist? Well, once we have these predictions, we have to add them up to a number that represents how interested we think you are in each story or post in your inventory. So in order to create personalized experience, we take, we, there's a lot more steps that we take to make sure people see what's most important to them. So one of the ways we do this, for example, is by surveying some people or whether posters see are worth their time. So these answers help us further understand who wants to see more or less of different types of content. So if we look at the patterns that emerge for these results and from predicting these discrete events, some of which include being tagged in the same photos or continuously reacting and commenting on the same photos and clicking at the same places, then we use this pattern to inform our algorithm. This direct feedback helps us better predict which friends people may want to hear from the most. So in a sense, we're trying to combine and link all of these events and predictors that come from very different sources, including survey data or discrete events in our platforms with long-term preferences that we get from our users to tease out what is it that they wanna see and what is valuable to them. But as you, can, as you can already tell, this is a nebulous concept. So a lot of our work as our data scientists lies in this process of valuing events. So thinking of signals like how often people interact with a given friend versus how many mutual friends they have and whether they match someone as close friend to predict with people, which people may wanna hear from, sort of invites this trade of questions and sort of directs us to what the, the biggest impact we can have as that is data scientists is which is how do we make an educated guess about how much these things are worth? So in a very drastic sort of change of topic, let's think of a world where the problem is almost exactly the opposite. So I also worked at Oscar Health and this is an insurance company when you can see, you can sort of imagine what the data looks like. There's a bunch of people that go to the doctor, the doctor sends a bill to their insurance company and I have that data, a lot of it. It's claims data and I basically say this patient had this thing and got this thing done to them. So the job of the data scientist in this context is very, very different from what I just described where there's nebulous events with value that we have to think about and we have to combine them in this algorithm. Here, we're really uh, trying to predict very low probability events that are really high stakes. We really never have to ask whether a person getting a terminal diagnosis is a good thing or not. We know this is an extremely bad event. We never have to wonder about the value it is, but we have a problem because data has to trickle in. So basically we have major selection issues, which is what are we conditioning on again, right? We only have data on sick people. So how do we calculate probabilities of the world getting sick when we only have uh, the people who actually got sick? How do we also uh, understand that healthcare is largely a behavioral, a behavioral setting when we're talking about the big data? So we really don't have to be doctors and biologists to, really, to 
look at this data that much as we have to be social scientists who understand that this is selected data and that doctors are following sort of a certain pre-screen process that is reflected in the nature of our data sets. So a lot of our major challenges is to, are to circumscribe the certainty level that we have. So for example, if I'm trying to find whether patient X has disease Y in a data set of claims data, I have to know if they're asymptomatic or if they have been to the doctor, then, and if they are and they haven't been to the doctor, then I'm never going to know this. So as a data scientist, a lot of my job is to say this can happen. How much, I don't know, but let's put some bounds around it so that we have an estimate of how much of this is happening. Uh, incidentally, I prepared these slides before this uh, world event, but it's been very useful to think of the world like this and understand what's been happening, right? Like asymptomatic patients are something that is in all of our heads this year. And this is something that as data scientists, we have to deal with all the time. So just to finalize, and I know I'm just giving you a little bit of a flavor of these things, but often when people talk about data science, they sort of, or the role of data scientists, even in behavioral events, they sort of do it all like, like an all-encompassing things where complexity here comes from very, from an extremely different source. And just like, again, to anchor it in what Claudia was saying, like we need to think about time, right? Like if you're an insurance company, you're mostly predicting events that already happen. Also a fraud company, for example, sorry, fraud detection finance company. Uh, complexity comes from an extremely different source. These are events that already happen and you're really trying to figure out from the data whether something happened in the real world. Whereas in big consumer facing algorithms, you're basically trying to predict an event that hasn't happened, but when it does, you'll be 100% certain of it. So how do we have impact as the S's in a world where problems are this huge? So going back to predictive, behavioral, individual, and Bayesian, we really have to think hard and like sort of go back to the drawing board every time we make a, we approach a new data set or a new problem and understand what the source of my uncertainty is. Like, how is it that my missing values are being generated? Is the event I want actually determined in my data? So I have a ton of examples in like, uh, Facebook and Instagram where engineers show up and they're like, I want to predict this with this. And like, you're like, the question is like, if you were this person's mom or best friend, you would never do this with this data set, right? Like you, you really don't have the data in these features to predict this event. And that ends up being a lot of where the quid of our job is as data scientists. Another big, big question that we deal with going back to Facebook, Instagram, and the multi-event algorithm is how do I anchor the value of my events? How about trade-offs? How about like media that people watch like in some way versus another way? And how do I translate those things into an actual number? Because our job and like the only requirement for an algorithm is a very detailed de uh, set of instructions, which requires numeric precision and things that are very often very nebulous. And finally, uh, and I'll finish with this, is the Bayesian part, which we very often forget. So independently of which algorithm we're using, and if we're using deep learning, neural nets, whatever it is that we have, what are my priors? What am I implicitly conditioning on? So if a human would, could make, were trying to make this prediction, what are the things that they would take into account to make an educated guess about this? And if we depart or don't know too much about this, then we run into a lot of problems that we've been talking about. So thank you for listening. Uh, definitely follow me, uh, IG, LinkedIn, I'll share my profile. And I look forward to hearing what the rest of you guys have to say. Thank you so much, Marlene. I did share your uh, LinkedIn profile on the on the chat. So if anyone wants to uh, follow, like you can go ahead. And uh, she, Marlene, I'm not sure if you did mention that you are a biker as well. So you can uh, follow her uh, various different hobbies. And yeah, I do get very uh, fascinated and inspired by things Marlene keeps posting about. So thank you so much, Marlene. Um, so the next speaker we have today is uh, Julia. So hi, Julia. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, so could you go ahead, like probably quickly introduce yourself and we can start with the session. 
Yep, of course. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. And thank you, Ashwarya, for organizing this and, and for all my co-panelists. It's been a really, really interesting afternoon, and it's been great to learn from you guys. Um, my name is Julia Melman. I'm Data and Privacy Counsel at Pandora, where I serve as a legal and privacy advisor to Pandora Media and the rest of the SiriusXM family of companies, including Stitcher, our podcast platform, and AdsWiz, our audio ads platform. Um, while I am not a data scientist by training, I do work closely with our data folks and our audience operation folks. And I'm sure those of you who are familiar with Pandora know that we have the music genome project, which is heavily dependent on our data inputs and listener inputs. So it is um, always at top of mind in terms of how we can improve our platform. And we have a great team of, of data scientists at Pandora working on that. So I appreciate you guys letting me um, join this session and give a little bit of an, an outsider um, view on some of, some of these legal topics. So I will be talking about some privacy and data science best practices. Um, let me share my screen. Um, can everybody see that? Great. Um, so I will be chatting about privacy and data science and some privacy by design and best practices um, so that we can put a little bit of legal guardrails to all of the amazing research and things that um, all of my colleagues have spoken about in data science and kind of put, um, not put in a box, but kind of help everybody understand what the legal landscape is. So we'll talk about the, um, a quick overview of some of the legal uh, privacy landscape uh, then we'll talk about what is personal information, including uh, the notions of pseudonymized versus anonymized data. And then finally, we'll talk about the relationship between privacy and data science and some best practices for implementing privacy by design and privacy by default. So let's start with a quick, a quick overview of data and privacy protection laws around the world. I'm not gonna go too, too much in detail um, into any of these specific laws, but just so that you can kind of see what, what we're dealing with. Um, across the globe, there's about 80 countries that have data privacy laws in one form or another um, with varying degrees of enforcement and compliance. Um, by those numbers, obviously not every country in the world has a law, but even in the last five years, there's been a significant number of countries that have introduced laws or passed laws um, and many others that are beginning to discuss kind of coming into global privacy um, compliance. So just to touch on a few, um, in the United States, traditionally privacy has been legislated at a sector specific um, level. So for example, HIPAA regulates health information, COPPA regulates children's online protection, um, GLBA touches financial data and so forth. Um, it, in the last few years in response to the very quickly developing digital landscape, um, political factors and, and other kind of developments within our country, uh, many states have begun drafting their own privacy laws and at least three have been successful including California, Nevada and Maine. And I think the most notable at least in, in the privacy world right now is the California Consumer Privacy Act which is the first, uh, the first state law of its kind really. It's the first state, US state uh, privacy law, which tracks very closely, but not exactly to the European Union's general data protection regulation, which I'll quickly talk about um, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, so that's, that's been a, a big compliance in initiative for us and for other countries, uh, for other companies in the US right now. Um, if you are in California and you voted in the last election, Proposition 24 might also sound familiar. Um, it was on the ballot in November and it introduced the California Privacy Rights Act, which was approved um, on the ballot in November and will replace uh, the current California Consumer Privacy Act and take effect in January 2023. And it will have a one year look back on data collected beginning in January 2022. Uh, there are about a dozen other states that have laws in draft form um, and various other forms in committee. Um, we expect to see, I think, more developments certainly in this year and in the coming years, hopefully, possibly and hopefully leading to a federal privacy law in the US so that we don't 
have to deal with this uh, piecemeal kind of compliance issue across 50 states, because as I'm sure we all know, regulating the internet on a state by state basis doesn't sound particularly easy and a little bit painful for big companies. So, so we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, and then just quickly, uh, EU GDPR, you might be familiar with that if you're at a global company. Um, this went into effect in May 2018 and applies to all EU member states. It replaces the previous data privacy directive and is considered the gold standard um, for privacy law throughout the world. The, the goal of this was to harmonize the data privacy approach throughout Europe and promote consistency in enforcement across the member states. And it has been used as the model for many other privacy laws in the world, including CCPA, including um, the Brazil LGPD, which was passed just earlier this summer. Um, and, and so a lot of countries are kind of taking uh, GDPR as, as the template for modeling their own data privacy laws. Uh, as I mentioned, Brazil's LGPD was passed uh, earlier this summer after um, uh, it was passed and then postponed and there were political um, po political factors that kind of led to the delay there, but it is passed. Um, and then Canada has a relatively robust privacy framework with a federal law and other provincial privacy regulations, as well as a draft bill which was introduced in 2020 and closely tracks GDPR as well. And then of course, across the globe, um, in most of the other continents, we have privacy laws in both effective and draft form. Um, and we expect to see more coming in the next few years. So with all this discussion of privacy, what are the laws meant to govern? So primarily, these laws are meant to protect personal information. So what is personal information? Personal information is any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person, including information that can be used on its own or in combination with other information to identify an individual. So this casts a pretty broad net here. Um, and it, it includes all of the information you know, that we would kind of consider generally as personal information such as a name or a social security number or another government issued ID, um, but also includes things like a unique identifier, a mobile ad ID, um, an IP address, which we may not have thought of as, as personal or identifying even in the last five years, but given the advancements in data science and the way that we can um, combine data with other pieces of data that exist, uh, the laws have decided that these are now worth protecting as personal information. Um, also worth mentioning when talking about uh, personal information are pseudonymized and anonymized data, which I'm sure are terms that are very familiar to this group. Um, so, and we hear these terms often, I think, when we're dealing with sets of data where the actual identity of a person is not material to the goal of the data analysis, but where individual data points might be examined as part of a larger set of data. Um, so pseudonymized data, uh, as per some of the laws that I had mentioned before, include individual level information that does not directly identify a person um, but can be used to identify a person with additional data inputs. So for example, if you replace my name with 123XYZ and then include my gender and my age, um, if we're able to re-identify me using a match table or if you hold the decryption key on that information, we're still considering that pseudonymized, not anonymized. And um, worth mentioning also is that even if data is pseudonymized under many of these laws, it's still considered personal information. Um, it's considered a less risky set of personal information in terms of processing, but the laws do require that it be handled and secured in the same way as personal information. Uh, and then of course, anonymized data, which I, I believe Roxy had mentioned this in her presentation that it's very difficult actually to, to truly anonymize a piece of information um, especially, uh, you know, given how much data exists these days. Um, and if, if 
data is to be truly anonymized, it has to be irreversibly unlinked to a person. So that means that there can be no match key or decryption key anywhere in any database, whether it's yours or another one that would enable you to re-identify an individual. So that's a very high bar. Um, that's at an individual level. And then of course, if, if you're dealing with an aggregated data set, um, impression counts or you know just a, a broad kind of statement about how many people did something or bought something, um, that's pretty safely anonymized. Um, so you know, just kind of keep that in the back of your mind um, when dealing with, with different forms of information. And then just, just as an example, one kind of illustrative example. So you know, in data science, obviously there's giant, giant data sets. Um, but in terms of, of re-identifiability, um, sample size is also a really important factor. Um, when, when talking about whether something is anonymized or pseudonymized or identifiable. Um, a former colleague I work with like to use this example where if you have a data table that has age, gender, zip code, and a car type, where the zip code represents a very small town with only a thousand people and the car type is a red Ferrari, um, it's pretty easy for you to figure out who that person is if you have access to the table and you are familiar with that area, um, even though on its face, you, you may not be able to you know, directly determine who this person is. Um, and it's an exaggerated example, but the point is that no directly identifiable information, um, just because no directly identifiable information is included in a data set doesn't mean that it's you know, completely anonymized um, in a way that would not allow a person to be re-identified. So let's talk about data science and privacy. Um, so a few, a few risks that kind of come up in the data science uh, context when we're talking about privacy. So repurposing of personal data. Um, whenever, whenever we're using personal data, it, it's important to make sure that we're using it for the purpose for which it was originally collected um, and for the purposes for which it was originally disclosed. Um, companies are bound by the privacy notices and disclosures made available to their end users and their visitors um, on their website. And any use inconsistent with that um, can, can cause a legal risk um, as well as a publicity risk. So that's, that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, using too much data, while high volume data sets can be extremely useful and, and uh, you know, often the most useful, using too much or data beyond what is really necessary to achieve a particular purpose um, can lead to legal risk, can lead to data leakage um, in, in terms of a breach perspective. Um, you know, if you use data or, or if you collect data that you don't need and you have too much of it, then you risk, um, you, you risk having a breach of data that you really didn't need to have in the first place. Uh, data quality, uh, of course, as I'm sure you all know, uh, inaccurate data can lead to poor data quality, um, but also data that hasn't been properly consented to or collected in a manner that is inconsistent with a privacy notice or the law can lead to bad data um, and, can, and can prevent you from doing what you would want to do with the data or, or manipulating it in a way that you might think is um, useful because it's, it hasn't been uh, collected in, in a privacy compliant way. And then the lack of transparency, um, again, staying consistent with promises that you make to your end users and being sure to do what you say and say what you do in terms of how you handle personal information. Again, this is, this is a legal risk as well as a publicity risk. Companies always want to stay true to, to their public persona and how they go out to the market in terms of what they say they do with the information that they possess. Uh, of course, the last thing is risk of re-identification. Um, in presenting and analyzing large data sets, you know, the re-identification risk may be low, but the, it's also worth thinking about, you know, what, what is the harm to a person if they were re-identified? If you have a sensitive data set, um, you know, with health information or with financial information, credit score information like Claudia and Marlene were talking about, 
um, you know, what's the harm that could come to an individual for that and, and how can we um, mitigate that? And these are just a few risks. I mean, you know, these are kind of top of mind, but uh, just to kind of introduce some of the topics there. So how can we mitigate all of those legal risks? Um, so there's a couple things you can do. Um, privacy by design and privacy by default are concepts that you can put into place at your organization and in your role as data science to build privacy into all of the aspects of your projects and processes and making sure that you keep privacy in mind in, in every step of the way. So privacy by design is basically that and privacy by default is, is a concept where um, you apply the most privacy protective um, implementation. So for example, setting a user profile to the most private when they create an account rather than making it by default public or, or just opening it up. Um, so those, those are just kind of concepts to frame how you think about things. Um, and then, you know, specific best practices, define the scope of the project, understand what it is you're doing, um, kind of think through it. What data do you need? Uh, why do you need it? Define the purpose. Why are you doing this? What's the goal? And then just, you know, kind of keep in mind the data that you're asking for, the data that you hope to receive. Um, data minimization, so uh, avoid collecting or processing data just because um, or because maybe at some point down the road it'll be useful. Um, doing this not only reduces your uh, you know, it helps with storage, obviously, big data sets take up a lot of space, but it also helps to minimize risk of data breach, like I mentioned earlier, and it's also just the best practice. Um, you know, you, you don't want to be keeping information that you don't use. Um, it gets stale and it, it just kind of, you know, it makes the data set a little bit yet less useful. Um, pseudonymize and anonymize data where you can. This, this, um, makes the data in and of itself a little bit less privacy risky. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, confirm that you are abiding by your privacy notice. And if you're unsure, you know, consult with your legal team or just take a look and see if, if things line up. And if not, um, just ask, you know, they're, they're happy to help. We're always happy to help data scientists, especially when it comes to privacy. Um, take steps to ensure your data is accurate and up to date so that you A, have the best data and that also you're representing the individuals in the data set in the most you know, accurate manner from a privacy perspective. Um, and not to mention also that some of the data privacy laws have a right for individuals to correct their data. So to the extent that somebody does come and asks to correct their data, you'll be forced to update the data set anyway. Um, and then of course, always just keep privacy at the top of mind. Uh, if the scope changes, go through this analysis again, think through the scope, the, the purpose, whether the data is compliant with the privacy notice and um, then yeah, that's pretty much privacy by design, just keeping it at top of mind. Um, I think that's the last slide. Great, thank you so thank much, you. Julia. Yep, thank I was, you. I was like, uh, this is something which is really important to me as well. Like uh, this thing which I have been reading a lot about uh, with respect to like ethical AI and data privacy coming up. Uh, when someone asked me like, what's the next thing like uh, which you feel would be affecting the data science or machine learning space, uh, data privacy was the most important thing which I could think about because as in when people like, so data science is this new technology, right? Like everyone is uh, really fascinated about and everyone is trying out various different things, but as in when they see the impact of these technologies on the society, that's when they start realizing that it could also have like um, 
adverse effects if it could if it's not handled the right way and it is uh, really important for people to understand uh, like the way our data is being used and that's something i keep uh, like insisting upon to all all the people i i talk to about data science that be very aware of which applications are you giving permissions to and how are these applications using your data because unknowingly you're giving out a lot of your information and it could be misused in various different ways and as a user as a customer we need to realize that the applications are not surely free for us but we are the ones who are giving them free information we are we are their products and uh, like we are not just using a service so uh, that that is something which is like really important and um, i feel a lot of uh, people are uh, being aware of these and a lot of companies are also acknowledging the fact that uh, they should be following various different constraints and uh, policies in effect of data privacy with all the products in machine learning that they're building yep so you you really like uh, hit the right spot there and thank you so much it was like a very insightful talk thank you so much julia so um i would again like put up julia's um linkedin profile so people can just go ahead and follow um give me a second in the meanwhile uh, i would probably request all the other speakers to be ready uh, we would be going ahead with the uh, data science panel so okay here is julia's profile uh, people can go ahead and follow her on linkedin and uh, she would be having a lot of insights into uh, ethical ai data privacy uh, and if you have any questions around that okay thank you so um, i hope everyone is here and the first question which uh, we found like the first question which suzan posted and we have been getting a lot from those um, other folks as well is what how do you like start your uh, career as a data scientist uh, what is the right background to have to start your career in data science um so i'll probably start with julia as your uh, on here so what are your thoughts julia like what is the right way and uh, who should be following data science career and how should one start doing it so i mean i i i am not a data scientist by training right but i i do work with with many folks in in the field um i don't know that there is a right way uh to, to start your career and, and perhaps my my other panelists have more insight from the data science perspective more generally but you know I think the first job is always the hardest job if you're coming right out of college or, or right out of you know your educational career it's always really hard um, that jumping off point is just you know it's it's always really hard to climb that mountain but once you're there um, things seem to become a little bit easier I think just you know building up your LinkedIn keeping your connections um, applying to a lot of things, you know, just throw it all out there and see what sticks, you know, something will, um, and don't get discouraged. You know, it's, it's, it's a weird time <laughs> right now for everybody. So I, I think everybody's very empathetic to, um, people who are seeking jobs. And I've seen a lot of things on LinkedIn where people are, are very encouraging and, and posting, you know, if, if you want to chat or if you want to have coffee, things like that. So just, keep your network open. That's a general comment, not, not really data science, but hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, that, thank you so much, Julia, for that. Um, I'll probably like uh, ask Claudia, like what is your opinion in um, having the right track for uh, entering the space in data science? Um, I think there are many different flavors of roles for data scientists. So I will speak more about what typically I'm looking for in a data scientist. Um, uh, let me start out by what I'm not looking for, um, um, and that is uh, certifications of all kinds around data science uh, uh, things you could have taken. Uh, I found them to be, if at all, a negative signal. So if a person shows up with three certifications in data science, I tend to wonder if they couldn't have some, done something more useful with their time. That's my personal prejudice, and I'm, I'm happy to debate that. Um, I have found that the hardest piece is actually to have experience with data uh, because very often in kind of streamlined uh, academic settings, the data sets are kind of pre-cooked for you uh, very often. And I feel that um, I love 
I love folks that have gone out and gotten data from repositories, from cities who are publishing data and just gotten familiar and looked around um, and, and have some kind of um, intuition around how to look at data. And unfortunately, that's a kind of a tedious process. You can start out by uh, doing some things on Kaggle. And it's not about winning. It's just about uh, kind of getting a sense of what different data sets look like, getting the tool set. The other part that I need is um, you do need to be able to code on some level. I mean, there's just no way around it. It goes back to if you can't pre-process your own data, uh, you never have any guarantee that you can rely on your model. So, so the ability with tools like you know Python and uh, SQL and maybe can even some shell programming, um, I do feel that without having the ability to handle certain components, you don't have to be a Spark expert for me, but you do have to be able to manipulate data on your own. Yep, that, that's really insightful, Claudia. Thank you so much. Um, I would also probably ask Marlene for her insights coming from a social media background. Like, how do you see uh, like people who are entering uh, data science from a uh, from a different background, like entering uh, social media business? How does uh, how do people prep up for that? So I will answer a little bit the question strategically. I think it's often the case with this question that people ask this and they want, they're preparing their skills in two years and they're sort of trying to gauge the state of the world right now. I think what we need, like what you need to do is think of where the industry will be a little bit in the future. And I think, although I am very much in favor of like backgrounds like mine, obviously, because this is my experience, I think this door of having a more wide background and then landing on a particular job is becoming less and less common. So. Uh, while I do understand that like these skills are very valuable, I would try to sort of maximize my skills in areas that are not going to change, right? Like you need stats and math. And if you want this kind of behavioral stuff, I do encourage some sort of social science behavior. But I do think that data science is becoming more of an, more and more of its own discipline. So uh, like actually having like fixed credentials as a data scientist will be more standardized in a couple of years. And I don't know if this that complements what Claudia said or it's a different perspective. Uh, that, that gives a, like a definitely a good, great insight for the audience. Um, I would also like probably ask you, you like what what has your experience been in the field and uh, how do you see like people who are entering into the field? Like one of the questions which you just got is someone who's entering from a non computer science background. Um, how would their experience uh, in that field affect or like uh, be it be like a valuable skill uh, for them when they're entering data science or would they have to start from like a level zero? Um. I think that I can build on all the things other panelists have said. If you take a job as an entry level data scientist, you will be handled the data cleaning, data gathering and processing basic things task. So the efficiency of executing them is important and you need to be able to know the basics. So definitely the starting point has to be at a certain level of proficiency and it might be difficult for people who are not from computer science background. But then most of the job is not about um, just stopping there, it's about getting some insights from the data or starting from the basic processes and getting somewhere else. So if your background can be aligned with the problem you're solving, that basically make you a semi-domain expert. If you're social science in background or economics or some other things, and you happen to solve that problem, you can have better intuition. And a lot of times when we build models or do processes, you have to check your work to see whether what you did is correct and makes sense, or the model have the correct intuition. So if you have no idea in the domain you are analyzing, that just become harder. What's this? Um, for example, right now I work with juniors, I can't always check their code, but if I have some intuition of which direction is generally correct, I can catch errors that uh, if you check code line by line, you wouldn't be able to catch, capture. 
So those kind of uh, higher level background become helpful. And eventually it uh, gets to identifying the impact of your project and getting those projects. So whenever you get hired, it becomes a sales job. You convince people that uh, the data science can add value and you convince people they should give you a project. So then it's uh, not about the implementation, it's actually about communicating with people and convincing people. I think that's universal. Wherever you come from, you need that. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I definitely agree to that. It, uh, yeah, it, de it becomes like really uh, important for people to like not only just solve problems with data science, but to effectively communicate about how it's, uh, how it's like creating a business value. How is it going to impact their business, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so one other question which I uh, am actually like looking at is about like recruitment, right? So uh, with the pandemic hitting, uh, hitting all over the world, we are seeing that um, students who are like new graduates from the universities, they are facing a lot of issues because the companies are not operating the way they used to be. The, uh, the companies are not probably um, uh, hiring as much as they used to because uh, because of this uh, unfortunate situation. So uh, with everything going online and uh, people not meeting each other in real life, everything is pretty much virtual, even um, doing networking through LinkedIn, etc. So what are your suggestions uh, to the to the new graduates about how should they pursue uh, their career and like how should they network to people and uh, get going with their uh, with their new jobs? So uh, you, as you just uh, are online, could you uh, give us an insight on that? Well, yeah, networking and forming a relationship might be slightly harder, but uh, as for interviewing and doing work virtually, I don't think that matters at all to data scientists. You can work from anywhere as long as you have internet connection. For example, in my company, a lot of jobs, so I mean, banking setting, right? Some some jobs really have a hard time doing, like getting done when they are doing remotely, like sales. You are more effective when you're in person, but my team is not affected whatsoever because uh, we have 100% productivity, if not more, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. And I think interviews over internet just level the playing field. Everyone is in their home setting I think this appearance and all these other behavioral things become less important. You can focus on the message. It actually makes things better for people. Yeah, thank you so much on that. Uh, so Julia, like what are your insights? What do you think is like the best tips for people uh, to get like new jobs and like apply for new jobs through networking uh, in this situation? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the virtual work environment has been good and bad for some people, but for looking for jobs, I mean, if, if more companies are going remote, that means that you can possibly cast a wider net, right? You know, if, if you live in California uh, and you see a job in New York and it's remote, that might be, um, you could kind of expand your scope of, of uh, expand, expand your target, right? Um, so it, it kind of opens up the opportunities a little bit more, I think. Um, yeah, like you said, just, you know, networking, staying in touch with people, um, just be persistent, you know, that's, that's the name of the game with all of this stuff, I think. So Claudia is raising her hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, Claudia, I mean, what is your uh, opinion on this? No, I fully, fully agree with what folks said. And, um, I, I do feel that actually the interview process and so on hasn't hasn't changed that significantly, and there are some companies who are still hiring. Um, I think overall, the most you can do is um, make sure that I can find evidence of your skills. Right? It's not about the degree that you have. I mean, have a Git account where you share insights or publish some notebooks on some cargo competition that you can point me to, to stuff you have actually done or write it up in a blog. I don't really care, but show me some kind of evidence so I get a sense of what interests you, what style of analysis you like to do. Um, so putting, it's not just about networking, right? I mean, it is really about demonstrating practically the skill set. Um, so whatever you can put out there about your work, um, that's to me the most valuable. 
Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Marlene, uh, uh, did you have any tips? I see you were raising hand. Uh, I'm not sure if I can hear you. Uh, Marlene, can you try speaking now? I think um, she can't hear you. Can you hear me, Marlene? Oh, wow, okay. Okay, yes, great. No. <laughs> yeah, Marlene, uh, I just wanted to have your tips on that. On, like, uh, sorry, I missed the question. The I had a one-minute blip. Oh, no I'm sorry, worries. I missed the question. So, <laughs> no worries so we were just saying like we were just asking about like uh, as different companies have been more restrictive in hiring and like now that every uh, like all the opportunities and all the hiring process has become virtual um, new graduates find it more difficult to you know like uh, land with jobs so what are your tips on networking and like lining up a job at data science in, the, in this times oh right so I do agree with what's been said that like a lot of the interview process is very much unchanged from before. And whereas we've moved to a world where the harder skills are maybe easier to prove because in the hiring process, given the virtual nature of stuff, it's easier to go to see harder skills and to verify like interview questions that are more technical and stuff like that than to build like the personal report part of like the job. So for better or worse, we're sort of over-indexing a little bit more on the hard skills right now, just because there's something that cannot be translated through video. But I would say that like, as a whole, I agree that the like largely the interview process is still working the same way and hiring companies may be hiring less because of the situation, but like, it's not a disaster. So I wouldn't discourage people at all. I think at Instagram and Facebook, we are still hiring and largely kept most of the interview process intact. There were a lot of things that we already did virtually. So I would, anyone who's in the job market, I would just reassure them that a lot of opportunities are still out there. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. Uh, even uh, here at IBM, uh, every like, the openings are still there. Uh, people are hiring in a virtual in a virtual manner. Uh, it's just not the same as we had earlier when you would have like a one-to-one -one person in-person interview. But pretty much the process has still remained the same. Like uh, people apply online, and then it's the same set of interviews, and uh, just that like all the in-person have now been converted into Zoom calls. So yeah. So I would uh, also like encourage everyone to be uh, persistent in applying and uh, to be honest, like be more focused. Uh, one of the things which I have also seen uh, in the past is that people who want to get into the field of data science, um, people are very broad about it. Like, hey, I want to be a data scientist, but you need to be more focused about like, what are your expertise? What are your skill sets? Which, ex like, which domain are you uh, more uh, more interested in right uh, each and every company has data science positions a financial firm would have a data science position a hospital would have a data science position a governmental organization would have a data science position but which field are you more interested in that that uh, really is more important. Also, are you interested more in applied data science or are you more interested in research based data science. So that also uh, describes different uh, job jobs differently. So um, I'm also like getting one uh, question about like is PhD an important of like is PhD a necessary thing to be a data scientist? So uh, I Definitely would probably uh, like to have your uh, <laughs> opinions on that. So um, you you what what is your opinion on that? I think early stage there are a lot of PhDs being put as data scientists, now there are data science programs training data scientists. You don't need to do a physics PhD to be a data scientist. In fact, most of the things you learn in that PhD is not related to data science, so definitely not required. I feel that uh, if people have a PhD in data science programs, they probably specialize in something algorithm related. Then it will be natural for them to continue to do that thing. But yeah, for most of the jobs, people are not creating or innovating algorithms. They are just picking a suitable tool to solve that particular problem. So you don't need to get to a PhD level. Doesn't mean if you are in PhD program, you gain no advantage. But if you haven't started, you don't <laughs> go and start one. Yeah. 
Yeah, makes sense. Uh, I see Claudia raising her hand. I would definitely need your opinion as well. Uh, uh, Claudia, I think you're on mute. <laughs> the PhD question is, is really interesting. Um, and, and I've kind of changed my opinion on this uh, over time. Um, in the old days when data science wasn't a thing, then somebody who did a PhD with data, I felt like had a lot of experience with data and kind of wasn't a good starting point. Um, but I've come around uh, to almost, I've started to question the academic take on machine learning where we're having too many standard data sets where people are too busy tweaking things and algorithms to increase the accuracy on some completely useless problem by point whatever percent. And um, that whole mindset is really detracting from the interesting questions like what problem are we trying to solve? Like how does it fit this? What error metrics should we be looking at which almost never is a currency of any sorts? Um, and then things like, all the different ways that your data can be wrong. So um, on some level, um, PhD is obviously experience. You, you spend some time working on something and you learn something. But I have come around to say, I'd rather have practical experience than somebody going too far down that tweaking algorithms uh, irrespective of data, uh, of data set uh, direction. And I've been a little bit frustrated by kind of that skill set that we seem to be producing in the more machine learning PhD focus. So that's my personal pet peeve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, so yeah, I have also like uh, seen this where, uh, you know, like when you are handed with like a real world data set, a lot of the times you don't even have a data. Like you have to find alternate data sources, which could be like right indicators to what you're trying to predict. And a lot of the companies are also facing issues where they have a lot of data, but they don't know what to do with this data. They don't know what's the, what's the right uh, modeling they could do with this data and how it could be put into use. So there are like both sides of the, of the coin. And, um, one of the things as Claudia just mentioned, it is really important for people to uh, have experience all on real world data set because it is not as cleaned and as, as polished and as structured as you find on Kaggles. Those are like really specific of uh, you know, synthetic data sets that's being created in a certain way. And um, those are some of the data where you can probably get like 95% or 99% of accuracy, but that's not the case when you are working with real life data sets, right? So that's where probably uh, one recommendation that I have for people is if you really want good experience with data science, go ahead and explore data for yourself. Like uh, try to find uh, like, you know, um, mine different web pages or like get data from Twitter and do say sentiment analysis on that and like find real world data sets for yourself and work on that rather than uh, focusing on more, more and more certifications because data science is um, very less theory and more of practice. So you will become a better data scientist with more and more practice and with more experience rather than getting like more certifications here. So yeah, that's again, like my take on that. I so, have one more um, small thing to add for the yeah. job question. I think uh, it's ideal or desirable if you can come out of school and get into Facebook, Instagram, or to Sigma, right? But those obviously are a lot more competitive. In order to gain experience, you can do Kygo, which is always free. You can also just join a smaller company, which might, uh, you have an easier time getting offer with, and you get to paid to still explore real data and solve real problems. And as you gain experience, you might be more qualified for those desirable jobs. So where you start yeah. is not where you end. You don't have to be yeah. ultra picky Absolutely. at the beginning or getting desperate Absolutely. if you don't get into big companies. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely agree on that. And um, so one last question I'll probably have for the panel is um, around like, what's the next thing or what's the next trend, trend that you see in the, in the space of data science and machine learning? So um, we can probably start with you. It's the auto ML AI that you just talked about. We are automate, automating our own jobs away. That's uh, the simplest way to put it. <laughs> I, I guess uh, if you 
<laughs> identified data science job as applying machine learning or using data to solve some problems, you still have the solving problem part. Algorithm yeah. is not the whole thing anyway, but that part is getting yeah. automated for sure. And all these um, LP and uh, computer vision models are getting trained by companies with huge resources, all the data access, and uh, they can pay millions to train a model. So as individual or small companies, you can't compete with them either. So it's like yeah. an individual's impact or where you can add value in the future is um, to be shaped. Yeah, that, that absolutely makes sense. I see Marlene. Uh, Marlene, what are your inputs here? Yeah, I think I like a lot of what I was saying or what I was trying to transmit in my presentation is that I think that even if we automate the most technical aspects of the job and I work with the most like state of the art algorithms, the job of the data scientist becomes bigger, not smaller, right? Like engineering teams are mostly focused on getting things to run and on like things working and precision metrics. And they're very focused on like the operation of these things, but interpreting what is going on in this algorithm, what is it actually doing? Is this a good thing? And will it actually like produce money or whatever we're trying to like get out of it is becoming a more nebulous question, not less. With very clear examples, like the more complex algorithms we use, the less feature engineering we can do. So we really don't know where they're getting information. Like I really often like to like push people to go back to whether a linear regression would, would work and what would it say? And very often we don't know. So I would, interpret this as much more encouraging and all of the AI automation stuff is I think making yeah. us more indispensable, not less. And like finally yeah. the 10 seconds communicating, like I've been told this a million times, you're like, we're too technical, we're too like, how do we get these insights across? And how do we like explain to key stakeholders what's going on in the trenches of the most technical stuff? So that role as like translator is also super important. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You need to like uh, have the right, you know, like right tools and right way means of uh, making people who are in the business understand how we are creating a value. That's when it would make some sense for them to uh, think about like infusing these technologies in their workflow. Absolutely. Um, Claudia, like I wanted your insights as well. Like what do you think is the next, uh, next trend in data science and machine learning? I think I will very much echo what Marlene said, um, that um, I don't find, I mean, honestly, writing a, a for loop uh, around uh, all 23 different algorithms to, to run them, but that was never the big part of my day anyway, right? So I've, I've not felt that this is um, really, um, the fact that that is becoming more prevalent, it makes life easier, but it's not detracting uh, from the data science role. And if at all, it shifts it into, um, a broader perspective of, of what we're trying to achieve. Now, the question is really like across the whole board. I think we will see more specialized roles where you see, I mean, data or machine learning engineering. I think there's a huge demand for that role. It's not something that I'm particularly good at and or would want to do all my day. Um, so I feel that that is uh, definitely the integration of these two. And we will see more tooling there too. But um, I still feel the, the one variable that will continue to keep us on our toes is data. And nothing about all of the tooling that I'm seeing is going to change that. So maybe it will get more convenient. Although I almost feel it's dangerous if things get too convenient feel like uh, you have to stumble through it in order to find the interesting parts. So I don't have a grand vision, but I'm not at all worried about the role as I understand and enjoy it to be going away anytime soon. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, lastly, uh, last not the least, uh, Julia, do you have any comments on like, what's the next big thing? Like coming from a data privacy uh, space, like what do you think is the next big thing? What are you guys preparing for as uh, the new thing coming in uh, in the space of data science? 
So, I mean, from a legal perspective, obviously we're preparing for further developments at a state level and international level in terms of new legislation. Um, I'm not preparing for a federal privacy law, but I'm hoping <laughs> that it will happen soon because I'm worried about a patchwork system because it's very difficult to comply with. Um, I think, you know, obviously I, I don't have as much insight on this topic as the rest of uh, you ladies, but it, I, I think that data ethics will continue to be very uh, important, especially in the coming years, especially with um, everything that's going on in, in the climate and how we use data and how thoughtful we are in terms of how we um, construct algorithms, how we use them, what the data inputs are, and then um, data for good that comes out of it. So. Um, that's just just my take on kind of what I've been hearing. That that's really amazing. Even I have been um, like hearing a lot of initiatives around data for social good, and that's something I'm personally like uh, really fascinated about. And uh, yeah, like uh, I would encourage people to actually search for data for social good. Um, these guys are working on really amazing uh, use cases. And uh, in the past, I did get an opportunity to go to Washington D.C. and uh, work with their. Um, hackathon team where uh, they were doing this on the spot um on the spot like uh, machine learning algorithm development and like you know uh, little data science challenges which they were doing for um, small startup companies who are mostly like ngos and trying to you know work for environment etc so these are like really important use cases and as data scientists i feel like we do have that responsibility where we not only look for uh, more of the capital um, capital business but also see how we can uh, you know you put our skills to use uh, to help the society absolutely that that's a great point julia thank you so much for that um yeah i guess uh, i am done with the questions that i have for you guys today and it was it was a great panel i was really really happy with and i got to learn a lot of things so this happens to me all the time like whenever i have this um conference or webinar arranged with so many of these amazing people i get to learn a lot of things as i did today um i would probably uh, expect any anyone who's like has more questions you guys can connect with us and um like shoot us your questions we'll always be open uh, for like more questions from you guys and would be happy to answer so it was a great session thank you so much everyone and um uh, i hope to see you guys soon we will be hosting more many more sessions with women in data science and um, we encourage you, anyone who is willing to even join the community, uh, yeah, send us a message. Or we would be more than happy to answer you. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you guys. for organizing all of this. You were our fearless leader here. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. yeah. Right. It was really fun. It was great hosting all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.